Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. We're going to talk about that Thanksgiving again. It's the one thing that most people, when our Father blesses us, and He blesses us with so many things, we forget to say thanks. And that's not really a very good thing, as, as I stated in the last lecture, for you to save and really get a special gift for someone and them just take it and walk away without even saying anything, kiss my foot or what, you know. Well, a lot of times that's the way people do our Father. And we went into a case or two of where Christ himself always thanked the Father when a blessing was given. If you want to receive a blessing, then you'd better be thankful for some of the blessings you have. And then again, we will always have those people that will say, well, I ain't had no blessings. The air you breathe is a blessing. I mean, he created this for us. The good earth that grows our food, that's a blessing. We have so many blessings. A good friend, priceless. And God created the soul that is in that best friend. And they are as they are, uh, not necessarily because of our Father, but because He gave us the opportunity to be. So be thankful for what you have. And more blessings will begin to flow. This is very important. If you feel you're not being blessed, you'd better listen. Give it real serious thought. And remember, our Father likes to be thanked. It, it's important to Him. It makes Him feel good. It makes Him love you. And when He loves you, I mean, He owns everything. That's when blessings begin to flow. Now, at the same time, you don't want to make a ritual out of anything where you just simply repeat, repeat, and quite frankly, uh, saying grace or thanks at a meal, if you're not careful, it's real easy to slip into that. I know myself, it's so easy to say the same words and thanking Him for the food, blessed to the use of our bodies, and uh, don't make a ritual out of it, mean it. Because there have been people that use it to put on a show. And there is an example of that, and Christ used it in a parable, and I think it's worthwhile that we look at it to, and remind ourselves you can't con God. It's got to come from the heart, and you certainly want to allow it to come from there. You want to mean it when you thank Him and be very serious with Him. Okay, so with that thought in mind, let's ask a word of wisdom from our Father. Open your Bibles, if you would, to the book of Luke, chapter 18. We're going to pick it up with verse 9 on this case of a man giving thanks. Let's hear his description first. Verse 9 of chapter 18, book of Luke, and it reads, And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves, listen to it, trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. In other words, it's a nice way of Christ saying they were self-righteous hypocrites, all right? Or a Christian that really took themselves serious, you know, I'm just too good for sinners. Don't let those sinners near me. When, in fact, a Christian that plants seeds must go around a sinner, but you see, we can't con God. He knows that we all sin at times. One way or the other, there are so many ways that we can slip while we're living in these flesh bodies. Uh, whether it be his health laws or you name it. That we don't follow his advice. And if you're not careful, the, it's the greater sin would be, be to become self-righteous and think more of highly of yourself 
for being so very good, you know, that uh, you, could, you, um, you would be disliked, number one. Hey, I don't want to be around someone like that, quite frankly. I'll tell you truthfully. I don't want to be around uh, a goody-goody two-shoes. I, I do not appreciate them because it drives away the unbeliever because they don't want to believe anything that a goody-goody two-shoeser would have anything to do with. They, they, they're too smart for that. So Christ is drawing this picture. It just so happens that this was a so-called religious man, very righteous. Verse 10, two men, he gives the parable, two men went up into the temple to pray. The one a Pharisee and the other a publican, meaning he was a sinner, just a common workman. Verse 11, the Pharisee, a Pharisee means separated by God, really, you know, set apart. Now, all Pharisees are not that way. This particular one happened to be. Listen to his words. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. With himself. Got it? I, okay. God, I thank thee. Here comes the thanksgiving. I thank thee that I am not as other men extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican, this sinner. I thank you that I am not that way. You're wasting your time thanking God in your own glorifying of self rather than our Father. I mean, I hate, take it serious, think about it. 12, I, he likes that word, see. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. Verse 13, and the publican, standing afar off. I mean, he wasn't bold enough to just come to the front and say, God, here am I. I mean, he felt unworthy and he held back uh, afar off. Would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven. He just dared not. He was a sinner and he knew it. But smote upon his breast. This was a sign of, of uh, repentance and grief saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. In other words, he was repenting, do you understand? He was being honest with God that he had short, that he came up short at times, as most people in the flesh do. Verse 14, Jesus continues, I tell you, this man went down to his house, that's to say the publican, justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. It's, it's, it's a good thing to remember. Well, it was sure a nice prayer. No, it wasn't. He wasn't being honest. I thank God that I'm better than everyone else. You think that's a... You know, I thank God that you, you, you can't con God. Don't ever, ever overlook your own shortfalls, comings, and judge others. We're not supposed to judge others. That's God's business. Other than using common sense to, of discernment that you're supposed to do, that is to say to discern what's safe and what isn't safe and and who you can help and who you can't help. There are some you can't help because they don't want to help themselves. And you have to have the gift of discernment. But that doesn't make you better than they are as far, because when God created the souls, he created all souls equally. It's what each soul determines, even in the first earth age and this one, is the reason they are where they are. So, think about it. Doesn't hurt to take inventory occasionally. I suppose, basically, as you might judge, that the reason I decided to teach this subject was that 
Many people say, why doesn't God bless me? And this being one of the major points in receiving blessing, because God loves it, is that he be appreciated, that he be thanked. Even as we, in the last lecture where Christ brought Lazarus forth from the tomb, he first thanked God, knowing, and he said, I, I know and you know I know, but I do this for the benefit of the people so that they know if you're about to undertake something, thank God for his guidance and um, his usage of you, if that be possible, if he is, and then go about your task. Okay, let's, let's go if we made to the book of Romans. Uh, we'll look at another type of thanksgiving of man in the flesh, and we're, gonna, we're really going, Paul is going to be very honest with us, and you can see, in a sense, Romans chapter 7. And in Romans chapter 7, Paul is talking about the law, teaching on the law, but then he goes on an individual basis. And remember, Paul was very strong in teaching, we have two bodies. Don't forget that. We have this flesh body, which is perishable. It, it uh, gets tired, it gets sore, it gets diseased, it ages. But then within this, we have a spiritual body. And that spiritual body, in a sense, is our true body. And uh, it is the spiritual body that must override the flesh body if that's possible. But as long as you're in the flesh, you're going to have to contend with the flesh body and don't ever try to deceive yourself that you're not. Um, I'm, I am a realist. I face things the way they are, and if it's broke, fix it, and if it ain't broke, don't fix it, all right? That way, life is not all that complicated, and with God's help, we're able to accomplish a great deal. But Paul is discussing um, that it seems like the spiritual man, when you believe upon Christ, all things are kind of possible, but when you have good intention, sometimes the flesh betrays you. All right, so let's pick it up at the 18th verse of Romans chapter 7, and it reads, Paul speaking, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, my flesh body, dwelleth no good thing. Now think about that. That's Paul's words. No good thing. For to will is present with me. Or, to wish or to want is present with me, to want to do what's right. But how to perform that which is good, I find not. In other words, it would seem sometimes in the flesh body, the power to do right just doesn't seem to master at times. And we listen to the flesh instead of the spiritual man. Verse 19, for the good that I would, I do not. I want to do good, but it seems like sometimes I fall short, Paul says. But the evil which I would not, that I do. It seems like the flesh is against the spiritual man to want to do what's right. Now, why am I, why am I bringing this into thanksgiving? Because it's reality. And you must face reality to understand your own emotions and if you begin to think highly of yourself, well, I really love my father, and I'm too good to sin. I, I love him so much, and I know that I can trust myself, and I will be pleasing to God. And then when someone with that attitude does mess up, sometimes it'll drive them totally away from the church or the father because they're so disappointed in self, that in itself is almost self-righteousness in reverse. To think it couldn't happen to me. I could, I could never fall short. I mean, God chose me. You're in the flesh, friend. Face it. If you pinch yourself, it hurts. And that's the way it is, that's life. And the flesh has 
that old central nervous system and the, the senses that are therein, the taste and the smell, and the, the, that, then within that comes the pains from the tummy that says, I'm hungry, feed me right away and feed me only the best that I want, not what God says I should eat, but pour it on me, you know. And you have, you have this little old body just working at you, ooh, I'm cold. Well, I've got to do this for the Father. No, you, I'm so cold that if, if, if you don't do something, I'm just going to pass out. And the person gives in to the flesh. You know, you have to discipline the flesh. And, and thought can overcome flesh. Most of the time, but there's still going to be that time, just as Paul says, I wish I could always do right, but it seems like what I don't want to do, that's what I end up doing at times. Have you ever said, had that happen to you? Well, don't, don't get too bent out of shape, my friend. And don't think that you lost your salvation because of it, but repent. Face reality, it's broke, fix it, and get back in the harness. Start plowing, start doing the Father's work. Be a can-do type person. Now let's have the next verse, if we may. Verse 20. Now if I do that I would not, if I do that that I just wouldn't do at all, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. In other words, the sin in the flesh, and don't ever say, you know, it really, uh, I know a person has problems, you know, they say, we sinners, and they don't call me a sinner. I'm no sinner. I think, boy, have you been mistaught, because they're still in the flesh. And I know how flesh talks to the mind, the spiritual body, and I know there's nobody perfect. There was only one. So um, you're going to have to face up, but that it is the flesh man. Do you not remember in Genesis chapter 6, verse 3, that God, it grieved him that he had made man flesh also? In the first earth age, it was just the dinosaurs and a few of these um, uh, remains, fossils that we find, not human, uh, but in, he had created man, formed the flesh body, and then placed the soul in it, and we have to contend with this. Flesh has things it likes. Flesh likes to take it easy, you know, and if you give in to it, you'll probably have a big easy chair or couch and a remote control and you'll settle into that sucker and you'll lean back and you won't, you'll have everything automatic, you know, so you never have to get up, you know, click, click. Flesh likes that. Woo. Just leave me, just lean me back here and prop me up and let her flow. <laughs> Flesh is a hard one to deal with. I mean, it's good. There's nothing wrong with flesh. God created it, but it's kind of sinful. You see, it doesn't think spiritually. The flesh is just going to let you know what it wants for the moment. You take even our reproductive uh, that, uh, that is organic, uh, or rather that, that is about us. I'll leave it that way. Even it will cry out at times. Why? Well, God placed it there. God knew what he was doing when he formed us. So he understands that we have problems. He understands how the flesh itself can start screaming at you at times for this, that, or the other. Don't think, don't think you can fool him. I mean, he made them. He created these flesh bodies that are very difficult to manage at times, all right? Uh, uh, let, me, let me put it, let me reword that. I'm a little uncomfortable with that. That are difficult all the time to manage with perfection. Just almost impossible. You can override that thing and override it and wham. Next thing you know, you pass an ice cream s store and wow, there. You know, not that there's anything wrong with ice cream, but maybe you've just had a dozen. All right, and there is my favorite. 
Oh, flesh, help me, Lord, you know, and zoom. The next thing you know, your car is whipped over and you got one of those little beauties in your hand and oh, boy, you're going with it and you know you shouldn't have had it, you know, but the flesh, I mean, after all, it was the one that was driving the car. I think not. You didn't want to stop there. I'm using that as an analogy to show you what we're up against so that you're not so disappointed and hurt with yourself when you lose and the flesh wins. Again, God created these things. He knows how they operate better than we do, and he understands. It was for this reason that Christ did die on the cross, that we could repent when we fall short. So I don't want you to be disappointed in Paul. God forbid. And I don't really want you to be disappointed to the breaking point of yourself. Sure, we have bad days, and yes, we get disappointed. But know what it is that does it. It wasn't your spiritual self. If it were to be that, you would really have problems, all right? It's the flesh man. Just think, someday we're going to get rid of it. Well, I, I shouldn't really talk like that. Remember this. Uh, I, you know, you have to remember that I'm talking to an audience that goes into over 100 million homes. And there are some people who have imbalances, chemical imbalances and so forth. And... I want to hastily add that God put us in the flesh body because he has work here for us to do. So you don't cut any corners or try to shed the flesh before that time ere the silver cord part as it is written in Ecclesiastes 12.7. As long as the old heart is pumping and metabolism is taking place, God hasn't called you home, and he doesn't want you uh, deserting. Because a deserter, he dislikes. All right, we got work to do, do it. All right, I just wanted to throw that in because uh, at times it's real, when we're separating the bodies, it can play on certain people's minds. And I just wanted to make that very clear. God has a purpose for you. And as long as you're here, you may not know what it is, but don't give up. Be strong. Make flesh behave. Okay, let's go with the next verse, 21. I find then a law that when I would do good, when I want to, evil is present with me. It's always going to be. It, evil is always with us. Why? We're in the, in the flesh. What he's saying here is, I try to do right, but... Wrong is all I can manage sometimes. Have you ever had a day like that? Well, talk to your flesh. Reason with it, all right? Don't let the little senses of the flesh with the central nervous system that's very well rooted into the brain, wherein dwells your spirit, which is your intellect. And face reality and deal with it. If it's broke, fix it and enjoy life. Okay, uh, verse 22. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. I, I just love the law of God for the inward spiritual self. I mean, it's common sense. Thou shalt not kill, which is to say properly translated, thou shalt do no murder. Hey, that makes common sense and... and and uh, no good person wants to destroy a brother or a sister, period. Just doesn't happen. It's good, all right, to the inner man. But what does it do to the flesh? Well, you don't understand what the flesh will say. You don't understand what those people did to me, you know. And just let the flesh get in a huff without overriding in the spirit, all right? The inward man knows what's right. And the nearer you can think and dwell in the inward man of yourself, the better off you are. 23, but I see another law in my members. Now, that's to say, I see something else here in my members. What members? Arms, legs, your body, warring against the law of my mind. Just This old body just wars against my intellect and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. It's here. 
Our flesh bodies, um, they ha it has no cognizance of, of sin. If it wants something, it wants it. And if it can, it's going to get it. All right? Period. It, it's, it, it's not, I, 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 it is not looking out for your spiritual man's benefit. It could care less. Your flesh could care less about what your spiritual uh, man will have to live with for the eternity. It wants it now. You talk about patience. Try to teach your flesh man patience. Now give me patience. That's the way it goes. All right? Now, again, I'm a realist, and I teach as a realist. I don't like to con people. I like to be honest. This is what you're up against. And hey, once you realize what you're up against, then it's a lot easier to handle it. Don't you agree? If you understand where your problems are coming from, it makes them a little easier to handle. When it's broke, fix it. Verse 24, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? It's going to die. It's perishable. The flesh, 25. I thank God. This is the thanksgiving. Paul would bring this. I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then with the mind... With the spiritual man, the intellect, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. In other words, as long as you're in the flesh, you're always going to have, you're, gonna, you're going to have that law of sin there just a nipping at you, all right? It's natural. God knew that when he created us. Therefore, why would he thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. I want to emphasize the word through. Why is it that you pray through Jesus Christ to God? Because when you pray through Christ, you're giving credentials that you believe he was the begotten son that died on the cross so that when you repent, your sins are forgiven, paid for, paid in full. Now that doesn't give us license to sin, but it gives us a look of reality at what life is about. Okay, one more. Let's go, to, let's go back to the Gospels. Mark chapter 8. Now we have covered in this lecture a man that was giving thanks in a false way, which served no purpose whatsoever. And we also looked at Paul telling us and giving thanks through Christ that God had the spiritual law for us and what we, that to face reality and realize what you were dealing with in the controversy of both bodies, flesh and spiritual. Chapter 8, verse 1, let's go with it. In those days, the multitude being very great and having nothing to eat, Mark chapter 8, Jesus called his disciples unto him and saith unto them. What was Jesus' emotions at this time? Too? I have compassion on the multitude because they have now been with me three days and have nothing to eat. Have you ever gone without food three days? If you have a good teacher, you could hang in there about three days and not suffer a whole lot. The old flesh would be squimish. Three. And if I send them away fasting to their own houses, they will faint, by the way, for divers, some of them, of, uh, of uh, them came from far. Some of them came from a long ways. They got a long way to go. I've got compassion. That's something Christ really has. He understands the needs of the flesh body. you got to feed it. All right? Verse 4, And his disciples answered him, From whence can a man satisfy these men with bread here in the wilderness? Now, what did they forget? Did God have any trouble providing bread in the wilderness for our ancestors when they wandered in there 40 years? I think not. I think they forgot who they were talking to. 
Verse five, and he asked them, how many loaves have ye? And they said, seven, six. And he commanded the people to sit down on the ground. Now he's got a mob here. I mean, he's got a, a large crowd. What does this say to you? He demanded order. Everybody sit down. And another place it would say in groups of 50 and so forth. And he took the seven loaves, seven is the numeric uh, spiritual completeness, and gave thanks. Christ gave thanks? Yes, because he's going to request our Father to do a miracle. And break, and gave to his disciples to set before them, and they did set them before the people. In other words, Christ did not serve them, the, the disciples. His servant served them. Do you think Christ is going to serve people today? No, that's why he has you. That's your duty, is to plant seeds. It's your duty, especially in this generation, to be a witness against the spurious Messiah. And that duty is a privilege. But within this, don't ever forget the first thing after getting order, thank God, thank Him. And then He will give you what is best for you. Verse seven, and they had a few small fishes and He blessed, again, thanking the Father and commanded to set them also before them. Verse eight, so they did eat and were filled and they took up the broken meat that was left seven baskets. Remember, there's 12 from the first feeding, nine. And they that had eaten were about 4,000, and he sent them away. He always feeds his own. What is this symbolic of? That he can take this word, for he is that bread, and he can feed multitudes all at one time. It's a miracle with modern technology that the bread of life could be passed, but I have to emphasize, thanks be to the Father. Always thank God through Christ. When you think through Christ, that means that you, in the name of Christ, gives credentials that you be Christian, all right? Now, well, will it be the same way in the millennium? Real quickly in closing this, let's go to the book of Revelations in chapter 11. Naturally, there's a greater, more in-depth study than thanks alone in the feeding, for you know the warning given concerning be careful what doctrines you pick up when you have a mob of people together in one place. False teachings and traditions can slip in. Hey. This 11th chapter, the two witnesses are killed in the streets of Jerusalem. They are raised back, and then we pick it up after this, the, um, the uh, seventh angel sounds in the 15th verse. And let's have the first verse in Revelation there, 15. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven. We're in heaven here, saying, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ. Christ meaning the anointed, His anointed one. And He shall reign forever and ever. That's, praise God, 16. And the four and 20 elders, who are these? They are the 12 patriarchs and the 12 apostles. Whether Amathus be one, we'll wait and see. We're not gonna have to wait too long which sat before God on their seats, fell upon their faces and worshiped God. They did what? They're still worshiping our Father, even in heaven. Don't ever be embarrassed worshiping our Father and praising Him. What else did they do? 17, saying. This is what they were saying. Bear in mind, Christ has returned. This is what's happening in heaven, not earth. Saying, we give thee thanks. O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. Naturally, the Son is here. 
the Father, the full Godhead de facto, does not appear on earth for wherever God is, that is heaven, until after the thousand year reign, or to say the day of the Lord, which be not confused for one day with God is as a thousand years with man. They were still giving thanks to God. Why? He's good. He's our Father. And if you don't thank Him, it's like rubbing insult on top of insult if He's good to you and you don't appreciate it. Especially if you're one of these poor me babies. That's him. I just wonder why God doesn't bless me. And you're breathing air, aren't you? Do you know who created it? You're, you've still got your old heart pumping, haven't you? I don't, your legs may not work too good and your arms may not work too good. But the heart's pumping. He created that heart, all right? This flesh body. So you got something to be thankful for. And when you thank him for what you do have, then he's anxious to pour more upon you. So thanksgiving is a very important thing. It lets Father know you love him. It sets up a communication between you and Almighty God that is very personal. Personal for who? You and the Father. Hey, you're his child. And that is personal. Do you have a child or a real close friend? That's important. That's personal. When you personally thank him. You know, for one that has traveled the world and has been in battles and combat and, and um, like at the Chosan Reservoir and, and uh, your troops were down to maybe like 14,000 when we were there, 16, 15, and there were 120,000 Chinese. Do you want to know how to really learn how to thank the Father? And it was no problem. Can-do type people there, friend. We came out. And, um, but it lets one know that sometimes in this great nation that has been so protected by the men and women of the military forces that some people here get a little spoiled. They don't even know what rough is. They say, I just have it so rough. You don't know what rough is. And it's comical, absolutely comical, the, the way some poor me babies whine and cry. And then it makes you wonder, well, if it isn't good when man, God really tests man at times to show him what he can do or die. Well, that's not a good subject to end this with, but I just want you to know, friend, you've got a lot to be thankful for in this great nation that we have the freedom that we have. You don't have to say, may I, may, I, may I go to the bathroom? May I go to this state or that state? Could I have a permit? You, know, there, you don't have to go too far from here until that's the case. And there are very few nations in this world today that you don't have to have that permit to go from one state to another within your own country. And you don't have anything to be thankful for. Hey, Wake up and smell the roses and thank God, most of all, that you have his word and God will begin blessing you. Count your blessings for they are many and your father loves you. Love him in return. Thanksgiving, we got a lot to be thankful for. All right, bless your hearts. You listen a moment, won't you please? The book of St. John, what a fantastic book we have here in tape for you, for your convenience of studying as you drive or whatever the case might be in the comforts of your own home. St. John, the writer of Revelation as well as this great book of St. John. John taught in a way that he not only interpreted, translated the word, and, and interpreted, fully translated the names as well as other things that made this 
word, this book, so easy to understand, helping the very reader see Christ in his work as God, Savior of the world. This book of John giving you the identity of the Kenites, as well as those events that would transpire in the end generation. That's your generation, beloved. All right, bless your hearts, there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the US, Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the spirit moves and you have a question, share it, won't you? Please never ask a question about an individual or a specific denomination. Let's study God's word and let the chips fall where they may and the blessings fall where they may and thank God for it. Uh, those of you that listen around the world at this time by short wave, your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. It's always good to hear from you. Now, uh, if you've got a prayer request, he's your father. Talk to him. He hears you. He even knows what you're thinking. So it's that easy to communicate with him. Father, around the globe we come, we ask in thanksgiving, Father, that you lead, guide, direct, touch, Father, in Yeshua's precious name. Amen. Okay, let's see what some people have on their minds here. Uh, we're Robert from California. I believe I had this one in closing the last time and I didn't have time to get to it. Let's see what Robert's got on his mind. He's probably been waited with bated breath all night long here. What advice would you give a new student like myself who is studying the scriptures very hard but knows he is not getting the full meaning on everything? When I study with you, it's fine because you explain as we go along. But when I study on my own, I'm not getting it all, and I want it so bad. And he signs it impatient. Well, Robert, God, I wish I could take credit that everything just falls in place for me, but it's a gift from God of teaching. And that's why you don't have to wonder if someone is, has a gifted gift from God to teach. He helps us a lot, we that have that gift. Do I claim to have it? Well, I sure do, because I could never understand with depth, and true wisdom is to be able to simplify that that is complicated where we can all understand it, and the Spirit does that for us, but we have to do a lot of hard work. And you got to remember, I've been studying our Father's Word for about 50 years, so, you know, don't, don't expect, there's no instant uh, way to absorb God's Word. There are so many languages that must be learned and other things that help, but be patient and thank Him for what you have, but the important thing, never give up, keep digging. You know, in flying, an instructor knows that we're beginning to learn when we can realize our own mistakes, our own shortcomings. Perhaps that's what's happening to you. Hang tough. Jonathan from Florida. Uh, Netanyahu. Um, does, what does this word mean or stand for? Well, it, he was just elected uh, as head of Israel. And Netin is from Nathan in English. Nathan, it means given. And Yah means God. It means given of Yah. His name, Netanyahu, is given of God. It's a nice name. And we might say, well, what did God give him to us for? Well, we'll find out, won't we? Names are important. Well, they can be. But in answer to your question, that's what his name means. Mary from Florida. It says in the Bible that bodies rise from the grave. What happens to the bodies that are cremated and are blowing up in service? Listen, the bodies rose from the grave on one occasion. And that occasion was when Christ gave up the ghost, the spirit, on the cross and it was a one-time thing to document for men that cannot see spiritually the truth 
that God had to make visible, whereby the spirit body is invisible in the dimension that we flesh men are. And he had to make them visible as though they were coming from that grave. They'd already been with the Father, because to be absent from the flesh is to be with the Father. And he made it appear that, why? Well, the old baker passed away three weeks before. Everybody in town knew the old baker, and there the old baker was walking down the street in his grave clothes. Why? To document that Christ was Messiah and that he had defeated death. It's not going to happen again. We're through with these flesh bodies. So it doesn't matter whether they're cremated or what. It's dust to dust. They're going back where they came from. And, and um, they'll be, when it turns back to good organic soil, the world will be a better place. Uh, I probably shouldn't say that, but I did, and I can't erase it because we're alive. Larry from Tennessee. It's the truth, though. Uh, God gave us the English King James Bible for us today. Therefore, we don't need to go back to the Greek or the Hebrew. This just creates confusion. Stick to what God gave us and stop mixing people up. Well, Larry, I didn't know I was mixing people up. Most people seem to appreciate it. What's your problem, son? Sorry it mixes you up. Hey, I'll do you a favor, buddy. It just so happens that I had, I purchased enough of the original 1611s to have Nelson publish them. And the translators, you see it was King James that ordered the Bible printed. Did God cause it to come to pass? Well, it could have because King James is one of the 10 northern tribes that went north so that we would have the written word. But there is a letter in this Bible it's called Letter to the Reader and a Letter to the King. There's two of them. I think it would probably mature you considerably if you realized the men that translated the Bible from Hebrew, Hebrew, Greek, and Chaldee, that they wrote a letter to you, the reader. I don't think you've read it, son, or you wouldn't be mixed up. So it might be worth your while to... I don't think I even want you to get it from us. You can go to any Bible bookstore and get it there. I don't want you getting it from our library, okay, necessarily. If you want to, fine. But, you know, probably if you got it from our library, you would accuse me then of all I wanted was to sell you a book. Now, that's, that's not... I've, money doesn't mean anything to me. I've never taken a salary for teaching God's words. I'm not interested in that either. I'm interested in teaching and boy, you sure need to be taught. Okay, you got a long ways to go, son. I believe I'd get started. Ed from Florida. I'm confused about Hosea 1-2 when God told him to marry the wife of whoredoms. Can you please explain? I'd be happy to. God divorced his wife because she was committing whoredoms. That shocks a lot of people. It's spiritual, yes. Jeremiah. Let me think for a moment. Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 8. God's a divorced man. And Hosea means what in the Hebrew tongue? And poor old Larry or whatever his name, I'm going to confuse him now because I'm going to say a Hebrew word. Poor boy. It means salvation. And to attain salvation or to save his wife, which is really his children, he had to tell him, so go marry her back again. Well, this looks forward ultimately to lo ami to ami. Ami means people in the Hebrew. Poor old Larry lost it again. And lo ami means not my people. When he marries them back, they come back into the fold. And then we can better understand and not be confused by God's word that in Christ a new wedding will take place. And yeah, there were a lot of them practicing whoredoms of religion when he took them back and taught them. Bev from Texas. I've heard all my life that there's going to be a rapture. Please tell me why most of the preachers teach this when it's not true. Well, I, I'm glad, Bev, that now after we have just covered this that you realize that. Unfortunately, 
It's what's taught in seminaries and so forth. That's why you must be very cautious of listening to man, but listen rather and check them out in the Word of God. This man or any other man, check them out in the Word of God. Joe from California, how can I purchase a companion Bible? Dial that 800 number or write a letter and they'll, they'll tell you how to purchase one. We've got them. It's, it's my favorite study Bible for a person that is not familiar with the languages. Uh, Marvin from Texas. Let's see. I know. Okay. Is it, is it true that no more is told about Jeremiah's mission to build and to plant Jeremiah 110 until he, Baruch, and the king's daughters appeared in early Irish history? in the British Isles, according to Celtic history. But, well, I can see, yes, right down to Queen Elizabeth. Yes, the lineage carries. Um, and it is in the traditions of Glastonbury, but there's one more little piece in the Bible. Jeremiah took the daughters to Egypt, and um, there, there is even a building there, the daughters of, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, Judah, and uh, marked there in... Um, some city in Jerusalem, in uh, Egypt, I'm trying to think. Uh, but anyway, um, yes, it is true. You're on the right track. Keep working at it. Okay, Marsha, Marsha from California. I lost a little boy who was only 22 months. Because of his sudden death, he was not baptized. Please comfort my mind by telling me if my boy is in heaven and I watch your program every single morning. I love the way you teach the Bible. Thank you for your time and consideration. Well, you're most welcome. Uh, hun, a 22-month-old a child is innocent. And God is not looking for little children to zap. He loves them. Christ would say, don't prevent them being brought to me. And an innocent one like that is baptized in the Spirit and totally innocent, and God loves him even as you apparently still love that child. You don't worry about it. He'll be there waiting for you. You will even recognize him as it is written, as it is written in Ezekiel chapter 44 that we will recognize loved ones. Okay, Renee from Michigan. Since the end times will be just as the days of Noah, should we expect the wit to witness fallen angels partaking in marriage and reproducing? Will they be larger than us? How exactly will we recognize them? Supernatural powers. If God himself, uh, well, it's, it, that's sure, they're coming back and it's going to be just like that. Only naturally, they're only going to have five months. And... Um, they're not necessarily giants. It was the Geber, the offspring, because they were hybrids that were mis malfactors, all right? God likes things the way they, he created them. He doesn't like people trying to change their races and all that business, uh, which is, which is uh, just natural. That that is natural. But yeah, they're coming. And the place, the kickoff spot is Revelation 12, 7, where Satan and those angels are booted out. Uh, Nicole from St. Vincent. Well, welcome. If Satan is locked in heaven, who tempted Christ, how, who tempted Christ for 40 days and nights in the um, Gospels? Well, he wasn't locked in heaven then, sweetheart. He was, he was um, walking to and fro on the earth for the purpose of tempting Christ to give us the example of how we must stand against him. Christ won, so we win. Christ said, get behind me, so he's behind wherever Christ is, and Christ is in heaven. Revelation 12, 7. Gloria Del Delia from Florida. How can Satan be in heaven now? Revelation 12, 7. He's there and holding. He's not enjoying any of the benefits. Lou from California. Why is nature cruel, and why is it so difficult to understand God's word? Well, well darling, nature isn't cruel. You know... You learn how to live with nature, storms and so forth. You have protection and you always take it. And the Word of God isn't difficult if you'll just take it one step at a time and not skip all over the place, but take it in context. Kathy from California. 
have you been divorced or are remarried? I noticed you don't wear a ring. Well, I don't. I really don't wear a ring. You know, we try to keep man off of our programs because we're here to elevate or to worship God, not man. But inasmuch as so many people think because I say divorce is not the unforgivable sin that surely I am divorced. I'm still living with my secretary, my first secretary. Been living with her now 40 something years. You know how men are, I keep forgetting. We were married then. Before we started living together, we was married, but she's still, I'm still living with my secretary. Yeah, the same one. I've never been divorced. And I got back from Korea and I was wounded and down. Couldn't hardly help myself and she took advantage of me there that many years ago, you know. So, uh, but she's nice. She lets me out occasionally, as long as I'm doing God's Word to teach and what have you. The reason I do not wear a ring is when I was a young man, I bought the, when my, one of my first paychecks was to buy the shiniest little thing you ever saw in your life. I mean, I was so proud of that sucker. Uh, it was glass, but I, you know, hey, it still sparkled big old diamond, imitation diamond that big. And then I dropped an anchor, a huge one, and a, and a little cleat on it caught in that ring, and it didn't anchor the boat, it anchored me, all right? Nearly all the way to the bottom. And I finally got loose, and the last I saw was my fancy ring floating away, and I swore to God, if you'd get me out of there, I'd never wear another ring. And well, I haven't broke it too many times. That's why I do not wear a ring. And that was uh, arranged with my secretary before we ever got married because I have a phobia against it, you know. Some men do because they get mashed and some men don't like to wear them because only the wife is married and they're not. Okay, so be that as it may. I'm out of time and I think I better get out of here or I won't even have no supper tonight if I keep talking like this. So we're brought to you by your tithes and offerings if we've helped you, help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, most of all this, stay in His Word every day in His Word. It's a good day, even with problems. Know why? Yeshua, Jesus, is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. You have been viewing the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you are interested in obtaining more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer includes the Mark of the Beast audio tape, a newsletter with a written Bible study, a complete audio tape catalog, and a list of reference materials available through Shepherd's Chapel.